Reef has allowed me to build a larger community of marine conservation supporters worldwide by connecting people to the ocean through the Volunteer Fish Survey Project. I've helped with the mitigation of lionfish through publications, outreach, and removal actions. I've gained first-hand field experience building deep water lionfish traps and educating the public about invasive species. Through Reef, I've been able to share my passion for marine science with others by leading education programs both in person and virtual. Reef has allowed me to spread diversity and inclusion through marine science by highlighting the voices of minorities in the field. Reef is committed to using our program's platform and voice to build a better world for the conservation community by reducing barriers and supporting accessibility for all. The Oceans for All Fund is a pooled scholarship fund supported by individuals, businesses, and foundations committed to investing in a more equitable future for marine conservation. By partnering with REEF and adding your voice to this crucial work, you are helping the next generation of ocean stewards gain experience. Through REEF, by kindergarten and first grade students, we're able to learn about the invasive lionfish and their impact on the ecosystem. Go in the ocean to clean up the invasive species. Creating inclusive opportunities for others to cultivate connections with the ocean regardless of zip code. Well, my favorite part was snorkeling. Coral reefs. <laughs> my first time. We got to see a lot of wildlife, animal, and sea creatures, and it was really beautiful. Together, we are making a difference in the health of our marine environment by increasing access and removing financial barriers. Through facilitating virtual field trips at no cost, issuing educational scholarships, and providing financial assistance to our marine conservation interests. Because of my reef internship, I've been able to build connections and explore new opportunities to advance my career in marine sciences. After learning about the Nassau group of I want to protect the environment, there is no more overfishing. You can make a difference by participating in Reef's Oceans for All Fund. You can create opportunities for the next generation of ocean stewards and supporting foundational change in how we work going forward. Reef is exploration. Reef is empowering. Reef is impactful. Reef is preservation. The ocean's more important than you think. one word you would use to describe this experience? Amazing. Mm, summer camp. It's fun. Super fun. Great. Awesome. Fun. One word. Fun. Exciting. Eye-opening.
from down the street to across the country. So we really appreciate everybody making the effort to be here this year. Um, a couple things before we get started, just so everybody's aware of the schedule. Um, if you don't already have a, a schedule, you could have picked one up. They're in the bags. If you lost yours, you can get another one. It's got a brief schedule. Amy uh, has some over in the corner. I put a couple of more over here. It's got a brief schedule. Um, if you need more information, if you need maps, check out reef.org slash reeffest. That has everything in it. Um, and today, what we're going to do, obviously, we're already at our, um, our first seminar here. We'll have two amazing seminars, and then we're going to have a little happy hour social. That'll be out in the lobby. By the time we're done with this first seminar, the lobby will have stuff in it, magically, um, uh, that we can't have anything in it during, uh, the, during the day, most of the day, because this is a work facility, so we try and be respectful of that. But by the time uh, the first seminar is done, we'll start having stuff out in the lobby. So by the time we're out in for our happy hour social, that'll be indoor, outdoor, um, lots of bidding, raffle ticket buying. Um, we'll have some light snacks, drinks, bar, all that fun stuff. And then we'll close out the evening with one more great seminar for the day. Um, tomorrow, again, for those of you that got out on the water, hopefully you enjoyed that nice, flat, calm seas I heard about today. Um, di more diving, kayaking, and snorkeling tomorrow with our uh, eco excursion partners. And then at 2 o'clock, uh, we will be, this. the doors will open back here about 1.30. We'll have Dr. Richard Smith here starting at 2. For anybody who has already purchased his book or wants to purchase a copy, he'll be here to sign books. Um, and just chat about the amazing work that he's done that's compiled in that beautiful book. And then he will do the se uh, seminar starting at 2.30 to talk about his work. Um, and when we're done with that, we'll close up our time here at the Government Center. And for those of you who have a ticket to the For the Love of the Sea event tomorrow night, um, the gates will open about 4.30. The events really start at 5 and will wrap up about 9. We'll have a beautiful evening, dinner, drinks, sunset on the bay. If you don't have a ticket for that yet and you're interested in joining us, please let one of our staff know right away. We can probably get a ticket in, but we won't probably be able to add any more tomorrow. Um, so we've got a, hopefully everybody, I think we've got a great crowd coming out. So that should be a great event. And then Sunday, for those of you who are still around, we've got some really fun activities at the Penny Camp State Park. So this is all in your... Um, brochure in the catalog and also online. Um, so there's the book signing tomorrow. A, we have some copies for sale in the little pop-up store out there and we'll have some tomorrow as well. And that's what I already said. Check the website for more. We really want to extend a, a big gratitude, a big chunk of gratitude to First Horizon Foundation. They've been a, a title sponsor of this event every year, basically, since we started ReefFest. Um, the, the local folks here are always very supportive of our work here. They came by the office a couple months ago to, to present us with a check this year. And, and we really, it makes this event possible. You know, all the, the, the free stuff that we're giving it, make sure that that's how we're able to do that um, to get you know, to have such a great weekend. And we've got a bunch of other community sponsors. Um, all these, you know, we couldn't do it without uh, our local partners. And so hopefully if you have a, an opportunity to, to visit any of these folks, please do. So really, we, we greatly appreciate that. Um, and then the, the um, Key Largo, Monroe County, they provide us with support to advertise the event. So if you've heard it on the radio, that's how that's happening. Um, at the end of, of each event today, we're going to have some paper forms. We really appreciate your feedback, um, and they'll be available at the door. We'll have some people passing them around, and we'll have a door prize for if you turn it in. So save the date next year, Refest 2023. It'll be here before we know it, October 19th to the 22nd, same place, same day, or same time, same place uh, next year. And of course, you know, we really appreciate everybody's support and traveling to and far and, and to be here. If you are inclined to donate to support the event or, and support the marine conservation work that Reef does, 
There's a lot of different ways you can do that. There's boxes out at the check-in tables. There's a text to donate code. You can go online to reef.org slash donate. So we really appreciate all your support. So without further ado, I am going to um, turn over my computer to Dr. Chris Stallings. I will close that. Um, I, I want to say a couple things first. Um, you can kind of switch over, I guess, while I'm doing that. Um, there's that. Uh, I'm I was really excited that Chris could come and speak this year. He is a professor um, at University of South Florida in the College of Marine Science. He has been working for over two decades almost on marine fishes. Um, he's particularly interested in looking at fluctuations in fish populations in um, and with particular interest in uh, commercial and recreational fisheries. Uh, he's gonna to talk to us today about Goliath grouper, an issue that's very important to a lot of people in South Florida and throughout the Caribbean. Um, Chris has a great long history with reef actually, way back when you're PhD, right? Yep. Yeah. So in 2009, Chris published a paper uh, in uh, PLOS One, which is a, a pretty prestigious journal. And what was the title? Uh, Fisheries independent data reveal negative effects of human population density on Caribbean predatory fish communities. And that date, that paper that he published as a result of his dissertation work was probably the kind of the tipping point I view as for reef. It, 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 he used reef data on, on large bodied predators throughout the region. And it was kind of the first time that reef data had been, sh the power of it had been shown in a, in a really wide way like that. In a scientific journal, it got a lot of press, and it was able to really kind of be the first rolling of the snowball of people believing in the reef data and seeing that it was more than just an educational effort. It was more than just you know, oh yeah, you're educating some divers and snorkelers. It was actually generating data that was going to be really useful. So we have always appreciated that you made that effort because it, it really was kind of the first pushing the snowball down the hill. At least I agree, I think. So without further ado, Chris Dollings. How about, actually, can you check it? No. Okay. So I'm not going to Bob Barker it like she just did. Is this uh, coming through good? Okay, uh, so first of all, thank you. That was a very flattering <laughs> introduction. Um, and thank all of you guys for coming to hear a little bit about Goliath Grouper. Um, when Christy reached out to me to give a talk, I got really excited because this is my first Reef Fest. I wanted to come check it out. Yeah. But I was also excited because I felt like this was my opportunity to give back to this awesome citizen science program. Um, so as Christy mentioned, I started using these data uh, when I was a grad student. And now fast forward almost 20 years later, and my own students are starting to use these data. So all of you guys that are reef divers, thank you. It's an awesome product. I think there's a lot of power in them. So I want to start here, and I bet I know the answer to this first question. I want to get to know you guys. So by show of hands, raise your hand if you're either currently a scuba diver or you used to be a scuba diver. Yeah, okay, okay so I've given this talk to other audiences and it's not that many, but that was probably 100%. Um, and if it wasn't, it was like 99.9. .9. Okay, two more questions. By show of hands, how many people have seen a Goliath grouper while diving? Okay, wow, that's, we had a few not raised that time. Last question, how many people have seen a spawning aggregation that looks like this? Okay, all right, so much smaller number, still quite a few people. Um, if you have the capability to get out and dive to see one of these, I can't advise it enough. It is a remarkable experience to be in the water with dozens of these enormously large fish swimming around you. And Florida is about the only place that you can do this in the world. So we have an opportunity right here in our backyard 
to do this. And we're going to talk about spawning aggregation several times. So my talk has sort of four chapters. I'm going to start by talking about the biology and the ecology of Goliath grouper. It's good to know that so that we can know what are some of their vulnerabilities, especially to human disturbances. Then I'm going to move on to talk about fishing and the management actions that resulted from that. And then get into a little bit about the status of their population and the science that we use in order to study them. We have to use different techniques, different tools than we use for the other fishes. And then last, a few comments about the future of Goliath grouper, in particular, the management of them. Uh, before I move on, um, I want to thank my collaborators uh, on Team Goliath here. So uh, Chris Koenig and, and Felicia Coleman at FSU, recently retired but still very involved in, in this kind of work. Uh, Dr. Deb Murray at the University of Florida. And then these three guys here on the bottom, these guys were all PhD students when this work started. They've all finished their degrees, gone on, published that work, and gotten jobs. So Chris, Dr. Chris Malinowski and Dr. Bob Ellis, they were students of Chris and Felicia. And then Dr. Ori Sadiq was a student of mine. Okay, so first a little bit about the biology and ecology. Well, their scientific name is Epinephalus itajara. I'm not going to be saying that throughout the talk. I'm just going to say Goliath grouper. Um, one of the most conspicuous uh, observations that you can make on these guys, of course, is that they are big. So they can reach lengths up to about eight feet and weights of up to about 800 pounds. Now, we don't see a lot of these big ones out here currently, but that's just biologically possible for them. They can also live to at least up to 37 years, so they're pretty long-lived. Um, they can likely live to be older than that. And then if we look at the distribution in the, in the eastern Atlantic, there at least was a population of a species of Goliath grouper. We don't know if that species is genetically distinct from the western population because there's so few of them or maybe zero of them left. But as, if we look in the western Atlantic, their distribution is from um, Florida. They can get up into North Carolina, but really it starts at Florida and goes down to Brazil throughout the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean. But again, throughout most of that range, they're, they're really scarce. They're either absent or they're at extremely low abundances. Okay, so to understand some of the things that uh, Goliath grouper are vulnerable to, we need to look at their life history. And so I'm going to walk through this step by step, starting at the juvenile phase. So the juveniles, so Goliath grouper, like a lot of species, have this um, complex lifestyle where the adults live in one place and the juveniles live in another place. All right. So the juveniles start in mangrove leaf litter. And then as they get larger, they'll move into the red mangrove prop roots. This provides them with an enormous amount of structure for protection. There's a lot of prey items that are available to them. And they live here for about five to six years. That makes them very vulnerable to things that happen within those mangroves, right? And they have super high site fidelity, meaning they don't move very much. In fact, we have tagged fish, gone back a year later, found the same fish under the same tree. It's amazing, right? The problem with that is because they don't move, they don't respond to things like extreme cold events, which happen, believe it or not, here in Florida. They also don't respond to things like red tide, which I think you guys know that happens in Florida. So after about five or six years in the mangroves, they begin to move offshore. When they do this, they're already about three feet in length. How many inches is three feet? Keep that in mind. They'll continue to move offshore and then they, they mature at about four feet. How many inches is four feet? All right, keep that in mind. I'm gonna quiz you guys. So throughout most of the year, they live in relatively low densities scattered across the region. But during August through October, they come together and they form spawning aggregations. So we're back to that aggregation again. The fertilized eggs then turn into larvae. 
They'll spend about 30 to 80 days in the water column as larvae before they then complete the cycle, settling back to the mangroves. Okay, so a little, that's a little bit on the biology, and that stuff is relevant to some other parts of this talk. A little bit about the fishery for them. So they've been targeted and highly prized for a long time, largely because of their size. Fishers like to go after big fish. But really the heyday for this species, for the fishery for this species, was between the 1950s and the 1980s. Now, in addition to being highly prized and therefore highly targeted, they also have a couple of behaviors that make them super vulnerable to being overfished. The first is, once again, they form these spawning aggregations where instead of being at low densities, we've now concentrated them in one location, which is highly predictable, right? And the fishermen can figure that out. They're very smart. And the other thing is they are not very wary of humans. So they're an epinephalus grouper. If you've never seen one before, you can think of the red groupers that you see. Or if you have seen a Nassau grouper, the Nassau groupers. They're kind of like puppy dogs, right? They just kind of come right up to you. They're, they're almost curious. So that's important that they're not scared of humans. So the combination of these things, highly targeted, form aggregations, not wary of humans, makes them kind of like this, right? They're like shooting fish in a barrel. Now, during this time between the 50s and the 80s, when they were highly targeted, the scientists were not doing a very good job collecting data on them, and so they weren't really tracking how the population was doing. So we've had to use some, some creative tools in, in which to piece together how this population was changing over time. And so this was a paper published uh, by Lauren McClanachan, which used photographs from the exact same fishing dock taken over time. And you can get a lot of information over the, out of this kind of stuff. So you can count, right? You simply count, how many are there? And it, it decreases over time. The other thing that you can do is use parts of the sign or the post or anything like that as a scale to which you then use as a reference to measure the size of the fish. And what she also found was the maximum lengths of those fish decreased over time. These are both things that we see when a species is fished hard or overfished. Okay, but that's just re, you know, piecing together the past. And although the, the scientists weren't necessarily collecting great data to track the population, there were some fishermen that kept really good data on what they were catching and they were in the water all the time. So they had observations on what they were catching. And they saw it change. And they started looking at their logbooks and they became alarmed. And so they went to the federal fishery scientists and they said, we think we have a problem. And sure enough, when they plotted the data, it was indicative of a population crash. So in response to this, the federal government enacted a a fishing moratorium. This is a draconian move. This does not happen very often. And so they completely shut down any harvest of Goliath grouper. This began in 1990 in the, Gulf, in, in the U.S. Gulf and in the U.S. Atlantic, and then was extended uh, to the U.S. Caribbean in 1991. Okay, so we put, we put this federal fishing moratorium on them. So then we needed to track the status of the population. Is it having an effect? So I'm going to give you guys a little crash course in some of the types of data that fishery science uses. They rely heavily on catch data from the fishermen. Okay, And so the, the fishermen keep logbooks. The fish houses keep logbooks. We often put observers on the boats. We often put observers at the dock. We use all this information to, to piece together to try to understand how the population is doing. So, For example, we can just look at catch. And if it's steady, maybe the population is steady. If it's going down, that might reflect that the population is decreasing in abundance. We looked at, at things like size and age 
ratios or st structures. And so that can tell us, you know, do we have a healthy population that has old big fish as well as middle age and young fish? Or is there some kind of truncation where we're missing those old big fish? And then we can look at things like sex ratio and, uh, and reproductive output. These are important so we can get an estimate of how they're going to replenish themselves in the next generation. The problem is all of these data come from dead fish, right? And so now we have a federal fishery moratorium. We're not going to have any dead fish to get these data from. So we had to develop some new methods. We needed to come up with non-extractive, non-lethal methods. And of course, that's partially where you guys come in hand, right? We can go out and count these fish. They live, um, when after they leave the mangroves, they live at depths between about 30 feet and a little over 100 feet. So certainly within the depth limits of scuba divers. And in fact, the reef data have been really important in um, the analyses and in some of the stock assessments that have been done. There's also the Great Goliath Grouper Count. Is anybody familiar with that? Raise your hands if you're familiar. Okay, so if you're not familiar and you're, you're doing citizen science um, and you wanna get involved with this, I have uh, my email address at the end of the talk. If you're interested, shoot me an email and I'll put you in contact with Dr. Angela Collins, who runs um, the Great Goliath Grouper Count. It's an annual thing. It's kind of like the, the Christmas bird count. It happens every year, I believe in June, don't quote me. Um, and they've got 10 years of data now. So Angela is with uh, Florida Sea Grant. And then of course there's targeted studies uh, conducted by researchers such as TAG and recovery type studies where we put tags on the fish. If it's captured, we hope that the fisherman calls it in so they can give us some information. But also we put tags on the fish so that divers can see them and hopefully uh, report it. In fact, this was a placard that we put up in dive shops all over Florida a few years ago for this work. Okay, so we use these data, we plot them out. And in the beginning, we start to see early, early signs of recovery. It doesn't really work because I'm so far away. But we start to see the population trending up, right? That's encouraging. And then using the reef data, here's the time of the closure, and we start to see more individuals at these spawning aggregations than we saw before the closure. These are both very positive signs. We can look even more closely into these reef data. And the first thing to notice, of course, is the majority of the population was off the southwest coast of Florida in zone four. And so you do see um, high bars here. This might be a, a sampling uh, issue here where it just pops up all of a sudden in 98. But if we take out these really abundant data and focus on the, um, the zones that don't have as many, this is important. Even though these numbers were low, it was important because the trend was going in the right direction, right? This is what we want to see. Okay, so this is one piece of the puzzle. But remember on that slide with the, all, the red, all the red snapper, um, we need other information. So we need information about their age. We need information about their reproduction. So the way that we age fish typically is we use these ear bones called otoliths. And as a fish grows and as time goes by, those otoliths grow and they have a banding pattern very similar to rings on a tree and you can count them. So the process is fairly straightforward. You remove the ear bone, a researcher will put it on a slide and then look at it through a, a microscope. And then you can see these bands in this otolith in this eight year old fish. The problem is this is a lethal method, right? And I just told you, we can't use lethal methods. So we had to come up with a different way. Fortunately, there are other structures on a fish that we can use to age, but we have to verify them first. So for Goliath grouper, we figured out that we could use the dorsal fin ray. We cross-sectioned them and then used that same method of counting the rings in order to verify, in order to estimate their age. And we know it works because we are able to compare fin rays and otoliths from the exact same fish 
If they're telling the same story, they should give us the same age. And sure enough, when we plot that out, it gives us a one-to-one -one relationship. That means they're given the same age. Now you might be saying, hold on, you just said you can't kill them, so how do you get the otoliths, right? Well, they also die sometimes, you know? Not by us killing them, but they just die. And we had, um, between FWC and between um, colleagues around the state, anytime there was a dead fish that washed up somewhere, they would give us a call, we would run out and sample them. Now, if, you're, if you've got a red snapper or something like that, you wanna take the otolith out, you might use a serrated knife or a hacksaw. But when you're working with a Goliath grouper, this is Ori, you have to use a sawzall, a reciprocating saw, in order to get through that head. This is, this is also one of my ex-graduate students. She finished Kara Wall. Um, and she's not looking down the beach at something. She's trying not to lose her breakfast. As you can imagine, a fish that's been floating in the ocean for two weeks is um, it's not pleasant. So this work isn't always very glorious, right? All right, so we figured out the method works. Now we have to go out and catch the fish and take off their uh, fin rays. So how do you do that? How do you catch a giant fish? Well, you start with a giant hook. You start with a giant bait. For, for a bait this size, we would cut it in half. Then attached to that hook, if any of you guys are, are fishers in here, we had a stretch of 1,200 pound leader. That's heavy duty stuff. It then went to a swivel, which is attached on one side to a five pound weight. And then that was attached to a piece of half inch braided nylon line, which was serving as our fishing line. That then goes up to a 70 pound mooring ball, which was acting like a bobber. And then it goes back to the researcher that's fishing for them. This is Justin Lewis. He, well, he's currently a PhD student at uh, the University of Florida. Now, if you've ever been fishing and something comes along and bites it, you, you get a sudden tug, right? That's not the way the Goliath grouper feeds. So you can imagine that this is, this is the bait and this is the grouper's mouth. It comes up and it just puts its mouth around it and kind of holds on. It doesn't bite down, it doesn't move. When that happens, that mooring ball, which was kind of floating with the waves, it starts to float a little bit differently. It's very subtle. It took me it took me a little while to figure it out. At that point, you slowly take that rope and start pulling it in. And what you're doing is you're, we're pulling that grouper away from the reef that it was in, which is often an artificial reef, very complex. If they get in there, we'd have to throw in our tank and go down in order to free it. At some point, that grouper figures out, I'm not close to home anymore. And it turns hard, sets the hook, and then game on, right? That's when it gets fun, and you better be wearing gloves. Um, usually one researcher can, can get it in by themselves, but sometimes um, there was one time where I was getting my butt kicked and I said, help! <laughs> and, and of course, everybody just laughed at me. Now, you guys are divers, so you're all familiar with Boyle's Law. At some point in this fight, as you're getting it up, the gas that's in its swim bladder, the volume is expanding, and then they just pop up like a cork. So the last, the last part of it's actually pretty easy. All right, and so this, is, this was a time when we had, uh, you know, a really good bite that was on. So we had three fish uh, that we were about to work up off the back of the boat. Um, as we're working up one fish, the other two would just stay in the water. They were perfectly safe. Uh, that's Bob there pulling it in, and that's uh, Bob Ellis, and that's Chris Malinowski. Okay, so I'm gonna show a video of us pulling it into the boat, I think. Will it work? That's a slammer. That is huge. That's probably the biggest one we've caught. I mean, like, in this trip. He's a slammer. That's not good. Things to notice here. So we pull it in, we, we gaff it by the mouth so we don't harm it. Um, then we throw it, on, we throw it on a gurney and strap it down. And the reason why we do that is to protect the fish and to protect, protect the researcher. 
having a flopping 500 pound animal on the deck of the boat is not a good thing. Um, the guy that was saying that's a slammer and it was in the orange, that's Captain Mike Newman. Uh, he was a commercial fishing captain for many years and then he saw how some of our natural resources were, were going downhill and he then began working with the, with the scientists. It's a really good guy that's helped out a lot of different researchers. Okay, so I have another video here. Um, and I'm gonna tell you a few things to look for before I play it. So first of all, we got it, we got it on the gurney. Notice that there is a t-shirt here. We either take a t-shirt or we take a towel, we dip it in the ocean, so it's got salt water on it, and then we would drape it over the eyes. Their eyes aren't used to being in the air. Their eyes aren't used to the sunshine or the Florida heat. The other thing that we do is take a water hose that's got salt water coming out, we put it in its mouth so that the, the uh, water goes over the gills so they can continue to respire. Now in this video, you're gonna see, this is Chris Peterson, this is Justin Lewis. You're gonna see Chris excising the, um, the fin ray and Justin's gonna be taking a um, gonad biopsy. Notice that the fish doesn't flop around, it doesn't seem to even respond to it. All right, see if I can get it to play. That'd be cool to see all these. Yeah, at least before the van. Well, I donated my shirt to Sarah. I should just lie down and see it. <laughs> What's that? Like that. You should have a good I mean, I can still can. Yeah. As soon as we get that cut, so there it is. Yeah, let's get a couple more photos of them before it's awesome. Yeah. So let's let's work them up quick so we can have time. Throw and... tissue over that, and it doesn't affect their ability to swim. Okay, so while we had these, these fish on the deck, we took a lot of information, right? So we, we measured the length, and from the length, we can also um, estimate how much they weighed. We collected those fin rays, took a gonad biopsy. We implanted three different tags. So one was a kind of traditional spaghetti tag, the ones that are kind of cylinder-like and long. We put that on, on the, near the dorsal fin. We would also put on a livestock tag on their fin. And um, we, we used those in hopes that if divers saw them, they would report them, right? That, that corresponds to that placard I showed you earlier. And then we would implant them with a pit tag. These are the same things that we put in our pets when we say they're chipped. And so we always kept a scanner with us. We, we always implanted it in the exact same spot. And so we would always scan the fish. This gives us redundancy in the tags and it serves multiple purposes. Um, you know, for, for example, divers versus fishermen. What's that? If they, yeah, if they have the little wand, yeah. Um, and then we checked their stomach contents. And I'm gonna show you how we did that uh, in a few slides. All right, one more video. So we're pretty sure that, we're pretty sure that there was very high, high survival, post-release survival. And we know this from a, for a couple of ways. One, we would put them back in and then dive the site either the next day, a week later, and we would see the fish down there. The other thing is we would recapture a ton of them. And then the other thing is, I'm going to show you releasing this fish. It's just spent five minutes on the deck of the boat. It's had its fins removed. It's kind of been invaded a little bit. Um, when this fish hits the water, it hits it hard. It looks like it's in perfectly good shape. And this is not on purpose, but pay attention to the music and try to remember who the artist was. T total fluke that this happened. And that fish was just ready to go and it, it wasn't in bad shape i mean any of you that are fishers and have released the fish or even if you've seen a fishing show that's in bad shape you know that's not how they re-enter the water okay so let's look at some data so these are the size data 
Um, first of all, we're seeing kind of a middle-sized population. We're not seeing a lot of really big fish in this population. That's okay, but that means that we're still in the early phases of recovery. And then when we separate these sizes by the sex, um, we see, this is a good thing, we see that there are, um, among the big fish, they tend to more likely be females. This is actually good because the bigger a female gets, the number of eggs that she can hold within her uh, stomach cavity are, is exponentially, it goes up exponentially, right? So more reproductive production. Another thing that we found is some of these fish were undergoing sex change. Now that's super common among fishes and, and among groupers in particular. But before this, we thought they were gonochoristic, meaning your sex is set at birth, right? So this is some of the first evidence that they actually do undergo um, sex change. What about the age? Um, again, similar to the size, we're finding a population that's still fairly young. So remember, I told you they can live up to 37 years. We're seeing sort of the middle, you know, kind of the mean of this around only 10 years. So it's still a recovering population. Now notice, this, so this work started about 10 years ago. So that was about 20 years after the moratorium started. Our oldest fish was 20 years, which kind of makes sense. All right, so a little bit about where are we going, okay? So we have some early signs that it is a recovering population. Things are going maybe in the right direction. That's something to be celebrated. The word conservation was on the slide when Christy began, you know? Well, not everybody is terribly happy about this. I've even heard people say that Goliath grouper are invasive to this system. The reality is, is that the Goliath grouper were in this system far before any of us were here, right? So they're hardly invasive. Part of the reason why this observation um, or, or this, this sentiment is coming out is because there's an assumption that they're just gobbling up all the groupers, all the snappers, the lobster that we catch and that we eat. And in fact, I mean, some people, <laughs> you get talking to some of these people. I really like that there's a, there's a kid in this fish's mouth. <laughs> The reality is, is, is that this assumption that big fish eat smaller fish and that they're gobbling up these groupers and these snappers is not supported by the data. So this is how we look into the stomach of a Goliath grouper. So we've got them on the deck of the boat. We put a six inch diameter piece of PVC in their mouth to hold it open. And then a researcher puts on a gloved, uh, a full length arm glove goes into the mouth, down the throat, into the stomach, and rakes out its last meal. So this is Bob, he's 6'5", so he's a big dude. Uh, that's a big fish. So then, we, then we, take, we take whatever that fish last ate, we preserve it and take it back to the lab and, um, and identify what it was. And so from that, we can get an idea of what types of diets they have, right? Well, this is what they're eating. They're eating a lot of crabs that we don't eat. They're eating a lot of uh, um, slow swimming bottom fish that we don't eat. They're only eating less than 1% of their diet is grouper or snapper, okay? So the data do not support these assumptions that they're gobbling up all of our groupers and snappers. So, Part of the observation why they're doing this comes from two things that, that are happening. They're taking a hooked fish, so you're, you're rod and reel fishing, you catch a black grouper, you're reeling it in. They'll take that, that's an easy meal. It's a tethered meal for them, right? 
The other thing is spear fishermen will have a, a stringer of uh, a fish on their side. And, and there have been incidents where the Goliath grouper would come up and try to take that. Now this has further complicated the issue because then they say that fish was attacking me. No, they're not attacking them. They're going after an easy meal. These are lazy feeders. That's why they're, that's why they're feeding on these types of prey. And so a stringer of fish, a hooked fish, these are easy meals, okay? The line of evidence that we know they're not attacking humans is thousands and thousands of people have dived on these spawning aggregations, not spearfishing, but diving to see the Goliath grouper. Nobody's ever been attacked, right? So these, these observations, these assumptions just don't hold up. Population uh, 10 years ago was considered critically endangered. And some good news, it's been pushed to away from critically endangered to vulnerable. Well, oh, you guys are gonna hate the end of this talk. <laughs> Unfortunately, the population trend is going in the wrong direction. It's decreasing. Um, and if it continues to go in this direction, we're gonna be right back where we started. I mean, there, there's no way we can't, right? Part of the problem why the population is going in the wrong direction, going back to, remember the, the first slides when we were talking about their life history, they're very susceptible to these episodic events, cold snaps. So this populate, the population was increasing and then these cold snaps just severely knocked it down. This, uh, this graph does not have the 2018 red tide effect on it, which certainly had a huge effect. If, for those of you that weren't paying attention to 2018 in, in Southwest Florida, it was a really bad one. And these, uh, these effects are also seen on the adults, either through direct um, negative effects, direct mortality, or because those juveniles that were to become adults never had that opportunity. And I do wanna point out, some of these data came from reef. They're also very susceptible to loss of habitat. So the general story in the state of Florida is we've lost a ton of mangrove habitats, right? The only exception is here in the 10,000 islands area. Everywhere else, the trend has been a loss of, of these super important mangrove habitats. And the other thing is that they're very susceptible to poor water quality. Again, the story in Florida is often we're putting too many nutrients into the water that's causing all kinds of different algal bloom issues or at least contributing to them um, as well as various sources of pollution. So this is concerning. So we've got a, we've got a population that's going in the wrong direction. We've got issues with the amount of habitat available to them We've got issues with the water quality, and we've got things that we cannot control, like cold snaps and red tides. And so over the, this, this discussion has been going on for years, but over the past two years, it's really gotten some teeth. So the state of Florida is gonna open parts of the, um, the state waters. Now remember, Florida's weird with the state versus federal waters. In most states, it's, state goes out three miles and then you get into federal waters. But in Florida, that's true on the East Coast, but on the West Coast, it goes out nine miles. They're gonna allow up to 200 fish to be harvested, 200 Goliath grouper to be harvested per year. They're gonna do this um, by lottery, so you have to apply for the lottery. The lottery actually be begins tomorrow and goes to the end of the month. Guess what, you guys can buy lottery tickets and if you win, you don't have to use it. Now I want you to pay attention to this part. <laughs> uh, I think it's, I can't remember how much it is to enter. It might be $15 or it might be free. And then if, you, um, if your lottery ticket is selected, I think it's $150, you know? Um, so this part on the bottom, is really concerning to me. 
It's a slot fishery. So that's, that's, that's a, not an uncommon way to uh, manage a fishery. So a fish can be too small, but it can also be too big. It has to be, you know, within this range. Now, I said I'd quiz you, 36 inches. What size do they mature? 48. 48. Yeah, that's a problem, right? One of the foundations of any kinds of resource management, whether it's a fish, a deer, a tree, is that we don't harvest that organism until it's had an opportunity to replace itself at least one time. Obviously, these are juvenile fish. They are not going to have that opportunity. So in addition to taking out 200 fish, we're taking out the opportunities for them to create more fish. In addition, if 200 fish are taken out, ultimately, more than 200 are going to die because we're going to have issues of post-release mortality for fish that are captured and then released because they're either outside the slot or maybe the fisherman wants to go for something else, go for a different size or something like that. Okay, so I want to know, why would we even catch this fish? I certainly wouldn't eat them. They have among the highest mercury levels of any fish in the Atlantic Ocean that we eat. So these levels far exceed both EPA and FDA maximums. I, I wouldn't eat a Goliath grouper, not only because it would hurt me, <laughs> but it would also hurt me, right? And I certainly hope that their flesh is not fed to either children or women that are pregnant. That would be really bad. And another reason why I say why take them out of the system is because, again, they're not invasive. They belong in this system. They actually appear to increase both the diversity of other fishes and the abundance of other fishes. And they do this because they're excavators. They move sediment around, and that creates a, a, a more complex three-dimensional habitat, which then draws in other species of fish. We call those ecosystem engineers. So they're serving a positive function within these already degraded systems. And then finally, um, it's been shown that people are more willing or willing to pay about an order of magnitude more to go out and see the fish than they are to harvest it. And keep in mind, harvesting is a one and done thing. Going out and observing these things, captain can go out Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, right? They can do it over and over and over again. So economically, it's far more valuable to keep them in the system. Okay, so this, this is my last slide, and I don't like to end talks on such a bummer note, right? So I want to leave with at least a little bit of optimism and a little bit of hope. Number one, th this fight isn't over, right? There were a ton of fishery scientists not just from Florida, not just from the United States, but internationally, that wrote letters, signed petitions, said, hey, this is not how fisheries management is supposed to work. Decisions can be changed, right? We're not, we're not you know, in a line drawn in the sand. This isn't going to happen. Um, citizens have reached out to their representatives or reached out to the FWC commission and said, hey, the fishery scientists say this isn't supposed to happen. So I encourage you guys to do that. You can do it as well. Um, so I have hope that we're going to kind of come to our senses here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, and I have hope that maybe Christy will invite me back in 10 years or so. Give it, you got to give it some time. <laughs> And I can tell you guys a much more positive story. Thank you. All right. It looks like some folks have questions. I will. Don't please don't ask your question until you've got the mic. I can't imagine if you made this same presentation to those who were making decisions. It's a no-brainer. Have you 
have you made the same presentation, all these same arguments with all this data that you've just given to us? Yeah, so these, argu they say? <laughs> these arguments have been made. Yeah, they've all been made. All of them. Oh. Uh, there, so the, the commission, when, when something like this is you know, on the table, they have a lot of public um, forums for people to come in and, and weigh in on them. And um, yeah, they, they've, they've been told all of these things. Um, some of the stuff that you saw in this actually came from a paper that was published in 2019 and directly in response to um, say, it makes no sense to do this. And so it's also been peer reviewed. These aren't just claims, wild claims that are made. This has gone through peer review. Um, have you looked at what kind of genetic bottleneck the Goliath grouper went through uh, on this journey from critically endangered to where it is now? I haven't done that, no. Um, I'm trying to remember if anybody has. Uh, but yeah, that's a good question. I mean, certainly when you reduce a population uh, as much as they were reduced, you do expect some form of a genetic bottleneck. So a genetic bottleneck is when you have so few individuals, therefore you, you lack a lot of genetic diversity. And so those become um, the seed of the population as it grows. And so because of that, the genetics in that population, at least at first, you expect the diversity to be low. So that's a good question. I just, I'm not remembering if it's been done yet. No. Chris, I have a question for you. Oh, there you go. Okay. Kathy Comerford, I live at the Jupiter Inlet and I have been surveying it for 32 years. I had three Goliath groupers that were born at the beginning of the pandemic, I had the only permit to be allowed in the water. Followed these to their birth, and just several months ago, I found one of their heads, which was quite disturbing. And as a town that's very ecologically motivated, my husband's mayor, we sent in a paper stating how we were opposed to this lottery. But I'd like you to know something. The fishing industry is gigantic. And it's very sad because he has all this good work and certainly an excellent presentation. I think everyone would agree by Chris, but there's so much going against us. I hope you keep pushing. We won in Fiji. Uh, they took out the wave machine, thank God, that was gonna go in. So thank you so much. Yeah, so the, the phenomenon of, of seeing a head uh, doesn't surprise me. Um, they are by, I, I hope it's a small group of uh, fishermen that hate them to the point where they will intentionally kill them. Yeah. Stand up, sorry. Do you stack academia? Uh, <laughs> I, Given the fact that you're, you provided, you know, what seems to be laudable and, uh, and validated data, uh, as you know, everything is politicized. So don't count on common sense to rule. Uh, so now you have to take a, potentially an alternative route. Uh, I know the Bahamas did so with sharks and finally showed I think they're worth one million apiece in tourist trade at one point in time. The last survey I saw, so I uh, I used to do another kind of science, but uh, so you can't, you know, you really can't count on uh, on <laughs> people people doing this. Is there any way to to, to somehow augment the uh, the introduction of the species through breeding or something else? protected breeding to get them up just simply because, I hate to say it, but this is America and we don't always follow uh, scientific, uh, what, what may be validatable scientific evidence in so many areas. Uh, so are there any alternatives that you're looking at? Yeah, so um, first of all, I'm glad you mentioned the sharks because I realized I had the, the graph of the shark ecotourism up there. And, um, that kind of led the way on some of this diving ecotourism, right? People wanted to come see a bunch of sharks. And um, for Goliath Grouper, the value is equal to, or if not even slightly higher than sharks. So that's, that's really important. Um, you know, one thing that you're talking about there is a hatchery. Um, 
Yeah, you know, hatcheries have a whole set of problems and the success of them, uh, you know, I, I don't want to say have a blanket statement that none of them have worked, but a lot of them haven't worked. Um, yeah. I mean, one, one place that I think that we should put our effort is to help reestablish some of the mangrove habitats, um, continue to improve uh, water quality. I mean, you look at the Indian River Lagoon and it is, it's, it's a disaster, right? And so even if we were to somehow successfully get uh, mangroves to come back in the Indian River Lagoon, you know, survival there isn't going to happen for a Goliath grouper. So I, there are things that we can control, I would hope. Um, and that's where I would put some effort. Uh, back to your science, the stomach contents. Have you seen any lionfish when you drag that stuff out? It could could be very useful if you could, you know, how helpful they are to get rid of lionfish. Yeah, um, we we kind of expected to see lionfish, and we never did. Um, lionfish, li lionfish have the attributes that you would think that they would eat. They're not Olympic swimmers, <laughs> so they, they could be, um, you know, pretty pretty easy prey. And uh, Goliath grouper have these plates on the top of their mouth that allows them to to crush things like. Um, um, like crustaceans and, and you know little crabs and things like that. So I think they probably have the ability to withstand the, the poking. Um, we never saw one. Sort of a relief that we didn't reach in there and you know get one, but also a little bit of a surprise. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the observation was that they uh, people have seen them take one that's on the end of a spear, and um, yeah, I don't I don't doubt that. Southwest Florida was devastated by Hurricane Eon. Uh, what do you think are the long-term implications of that? And are you doing anything to measure the, the counts in those um, those areas, those counties of Florida? Yeah. So, uh, you're, yeah, you're right. It was, that was a scary storm. Um, yeah, I, I I don't know because it it was well. I don't. I won't bring up the map, but um, it was right by where probably the most important juvenile habitat is for Goliath grouper. So I'm, I'm always kind of fascinated how fish respond to those kinds of events. It seems that um, they often do better than I would assume that they do. And so let's just cross our fingers. What's that? They're, they're smart enough to get out of the way. Although I think, I hope I convinced you that uh, the juveniles don't leave the mangroves. <laughs> so, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Sir. Um, so a few years ago, I t uh, when they conducted uh, the, the research and presented to the commission, and they came to the uh, about the Goliath group or opening up their the, 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 the take. And the previous commissioner and the commission did not open it up. They said, no, we're going to leave it the same. What I read in the last, now there was a new commissioner, the new chairman of the commission appointed, and he was especially adamant about opening up the, the fishing. It, and that's the story I read. And I want to know if you agree with that. Because obviously none of us want the, the take opened up. Do you, can you, and I realize that you're an employee of the state, and maybe you, you may not want to answer that, but do you agree with it, that it was the new chairman of the commission that, that ramrodded that through? Uh, well, first of all, I'm, I'm tenured, so <laughs> hopefully I can say what I think. Um, uh, you know, I, I didn't follow that much of who said what. Um, the general consensus on the entire commission seemed to be 
we're heading in that direction. I, I listen, I, I, you can, you know, you can, whether you're at the meetings or not, you can log in through the My Florida channel or something like that, I forget what it's called, uh, and you can watch these. And there were a couple of commissioners that were skeptical that opening the, the fishery made sense. But ultimately, it was a unanimous vote. So, so Chris, the data that you presented about what they eat makes it look like they aren't the apex predator the fishermen think they are. So my question is then where's the mercury coming from that they have such a high mercury content? Is it the crustaceans? I mean. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. So that's a, that's a really good point. Also, I, I didn't mention this. In addition to the stomach content work, we, we also took muscle samples and we do something called stable isotope analysis. And this can tell us all kinds of information, but one thing it tells us is where are they in the in the uh, food chain? And you're right, they're not apex predators. I mean, we, so we've got two lines of evidence, both from the, the diet as well as from, um, from from the gut contents, as well as from this longer term thing. So they're they're more um, you know medium in the food web. So uh, similar similar levels as things like other groupers and snappers, which is another line of evidence that they're not eating the groupers and snappers. So, um, yeah, I'd have to go back and read. So some of that work came from Chris Malinowski's uh, dissertation. I'd have to go back and read uh, what he speculated the mercury came from. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question because you, you tend to see that in species that are higher up in the food chain because you do get that bioaccumulation. I was, um, so I've heard the argument from spearfishers that the they're eating all of the fish, but also the other argument is that they're competing with the larger fish, um, even lionfish chasing them out of the wrecks. What's your thoughts on that? I try to counter it, but. So competing with lionfish? Well, competing with larger grouper as well, but also chasing chasing all the fish out, even if they're not eating them. Yeah. They're eating everything else. I mean, it, it would seem, I mean, based on the gut content work, I mean, most, most of our groupers are primarily piscivorous um, and they're eating largely things that Goliath grouper aren't eating. So, you know, the groupers that we can catch tend to not eat things like burfish. That's what Goliath grouper are eating. You know, if, if they're competing, I don't know. So competition only happens when there's a, when the resource is limited. If there's, if there's plenty of that resource, then it's not limited, even if two species are, are feeding on it. So I, yeah, it, it's hard for me it's hard for me to buy that they're in competition. All righty, we've got, we'll have one more question, then we're gonna um, move on. But of course, Chris is around for the rest of the weekend and happy to talk more. So Dave, why don't you ask your question? Thank you, Chris, for a great presentation. I'm sort of sitting here thinking that maybe there's another approach. Why don't we come up with a campaign to work on the demand side? In other words, you know, hey, you don't want to eat this stuff. It's not good for your kids. It's not good for you. It's, and if all of a sudden, you know, grouper was not in such a great demand or nobody really wanted grouper, then the, the fishermen would probably focus on something else that people did want. Yeah, you know, that's, boy, that's complicated. Um, and, and I'm also really... Um, you know, sympathetic to some of the challenges that, that the fishing industry faces, you know, in particular the commercial fishing industry. So I, I would be, I'd be hesitant to say, let's, let's just make people not want to eat grouper at all. Um, and particularly the, the commercial uh, side of that. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I hear you. I think that's really, it's, that's complicated because then, then you start to get into stepping on some economic toes. Um, it's also definitely out of my wheelhouse <laughs> quite a bit. I'm a glorified fish counter. <laughs> All right, one more question, and then we're really going to move on. I thought they were apex predators. Now I'm just curious what eats them. Uh, sh sharks will eat them. Yeah. Yeah, shark, sharks. I mean, that's going to be your primary, um, at least, you know, at the adult phase, um, that's going to be your primary predator that eats them. You know, at younger phases, Anything that can get them in is, you know, if you're a little tiny fish, anything that, that can you know, snook or something like that.
do, um, if you need to, we're not going to do an official break. We have our next, after this next talk, we'll have our long, fun, hour and a half, happy hour. What I'm going to do before I ask the next speaker to come up, I was uh, going to share with you all a video and a, a little bit of an update from our Group of Moon project, which kind of feeds off of um, Chris's talk a little bit. If you are not familiar with the Group of Moon project, um, this is one of uh, Reef's core programs. It, it's a monitoring conservation, collaborative conservation project in the Cayman Islands, looking at um, the Nassau grouper spawning aggregations in the Cayman Islands. This is a, similar to Goliath grouper. They are um, an apex predator of the coral reefs. They are vulnerable to fishing because they gather in those large spawning aggregations, similar to how Goliath grouper do. About 20 years ago, reef, uh, started in collaboration with the Cayman Islands Department of Environment, a long-term monitoring program on a relatively newly discovered Nassau grouper spawning aggregation off the west end of Little Cayman Island. At that time, there had been, it had been thought that all of the spawning aggregations in the Cayman Islands had been fished to exhaustion, to extinction, essentially. They were no, they were, they had dwindled to such small sizes, they were no longer worth fishing. That's the case throughout much of the Caribbean. There used to be vast uh, spawning aggregations. There was one of the early papers documented an estimate of 100,000 Nassau grouper. That was the largest aggregation at the time in the 70s, I believe. Um, but through the years, because of the, the timing and the known locations of those spawning aggregations, they became uh, highly vulnerable. And the, the population, many of the population trajectories that that Chris talked about, it's the same for Nassau grouper. They don't start spawning until they're, um, you know, between six and eight years old. They can live really long, up to 30 years. So I was going to share with you a video that shows um, some work, a video a couple of years ago. So we started our collaborative work right after this aggregation was discovered. It had been fished after it got discovered. Um, it was estimated it was originally maybe about 7,000 individuals. That first year, just a, a handful of small um, fishermen from Cayman Brac primarily with hand lines um, took about 2,000 fish during the 10 days or so that the Nassau grouper are there on the aggregation site. The next year, another about 2,000 were taken. So that was a lot of fish in a really short amount of time. By the time the grouper moon project was really started, our research started, the, the Cayman Islands government had enacted an eight-year fishing ban, which is similarly, like Chris said, that was pretty draconian. It was kind of like, you know, we're going to lose it if we don't do something. We need to figure out what we're going to do. Eight years is about the lifespan of when they start to go to the aggregation, the spawning aggregation. So they figured, give them one generation. We'll do the research necessary to try and figure out what we can do to make sure we don't lose Nassau grouper, which has such cultural importance in the, in the Caribbean and the Cayman Islands. It's ecologically really important. It's economically very important. It's a, it's a very popular fish to interact with as divers and snorkelers, and it's also economically important um, as a fishery. So through the years, the last 20 years, we're going to be celebrating our 20th uh, anniversary of the Grouper Moon Project next year, which is crazy. Um, and it's really widely regarded as one of the biggest conservation success stories in the marine environment. Um, it's a collaboration. It's truly reef, the Cayman Islands Department of Environment. We have two really strong academic partners at Scripps Oceanography and Oregon State University. And then most importantly, the local community, the, the businesses that are providing us the support, the infrastructure, and the buy-in to listen to um, the science that is being done. And the Cayman Islands, um, as our primary collaborator, they are an amazing group of folks. They really believe in, in this project and, and have made conservation happen for, for Nassau Grouper there. So if you think about, okay, it was estimated that it was probably roughly when it was found about 7,000 fish and 2,000 fish were taken that first year and 2,000 next year. So that left about 3,000 fish at the beginning of the project. 
we've documented and the fisheries since then have been closed. You cannot do any um, fishing at the aggregation through it, throughout the spawning season. And then there's a whole suite of other um, science driven size limits now and catch limits that have come out of the group room project. And, and those have resulted in an amazing comeback of Nassau grouper in the Cayman Islands. So last earlier this year, our numbers are estimated to be about 8,600 Nassau grouper at the West End site this now, which is like a fourth fold increase, which is, which is really exciting. So um, the video clip that I'm gonna show you is just a really interesting one. It's pretty short, but it just shows, um, it's actually from two years ago, maybe, the night of spawning. We do a lot of different research um, from pretty basic, you know, kind of visually counting to really, um, high tech, you know, stuff with lasers and and a lot of everything in between. Um, but during nights of spawning, our researchers will a lot of them are a lot of us are just documenting what's happening, and a few will swim through the spawning cloud to gather uh, samples of the of the gametes, and then we do genetics work on that and fertilization rate studies, and and um, so you'll see. We're starting to see a lot more sharks. <laughs> sharks are doing pretty good in the Cayman Islands over the last 20 years. They've done a lot of conservation work on them as well. And so the combination of the, the big, lots of fish <laughs> and sharks doing better, we do see a lot. And um, it's always a little eerie out there, uh, but it's a sign of, of health, right? When the, the ecosystem is healthy, that's what's supposed to happen. There's supposed to be big sharks swimming around. So let me get this going here. Um, hopefully that'll just pop up like it's supposed to. All right. And, all right, I don't think there's any sound with this. It's just, so this is the spawning has already started to happen. And um, the fish, these, now if you're familiar with Nassau grouper, you may think that doesn't look like Nassau grouper. When it's time at the spawning site, they have about four different color patterns that they will take on. And um, this bicolor, we call it kind of, they've put on their tuxedos. They all turn, when it's time to spawn, they all turn into bicolor, except for that there will be a few individuals that remain in dark coloration and they'll change on a dime. Um, so that's what's happening. It's the spawning has started. You'll see a, a, one of our researchers going through with a net, collecting some of those gametes, like I said. These are some rainbow runner. There's a lot of other fish activity. These guys are coming and feeding on the eggs. Um, and then this site at the west end of, of Little Cayman is a really important site for not just Nassau grouper. There's a, been about 25 species of fish that have been documented to use this site as a spawning site. So it's, it's one of those really special places that's worth protecting year round, not just when the Nassau group are there. Are there. We know it's one of the places that's, that's worth, worthy of protecting all the time. And that's what's happened with these spotting aggregations. So here we go. This will just give you a little sense of, of what it's like. And I'd like to call, he's not in the room right now, but um, Tom Spark is our amazing videographer who puts these um, videos together. So there was that shark that came through at the very beginning, I think it'll show it again. There's another one swimming by. Um, and the sharks will come in and they, they every once in a while we'll see one get caught, but we'll see some fish the next morning that have clearly gotten away with, with a few scratches. So here, uh, that's Bryce. That's my husband, actually, Bryce Simmons. He's one of the lead um, scientists on the project and has now disappeared into the cloud <laughs> of eggs and sperm, collecting the gametes there. And so you can see there's a, this is actually a, an, that was an older clip we do um, uh, now use actually mostly plastic bags because it, it's easier for the work we want to do. So there's, that was a shark that just ran right, and then there's a poor NASA grouper that, but they actually heal. It's amazing. We've seen, we've seen NASA grouper later, like that fish will probably have survived. They are really good at healing up. We've seen fish with huge, like semicircle divots that are all the way healed up. So they're pretty, they're pretty resilient. Um, so that's just a little fun clip that, uh, to share and give a little bit of background 
on the group or moon project if I, I would think that most of you are familiar with that but if you want more information you want to see more videos you can go to reef.org slash group or moon project there's a lot more information there about it and um you know as part of that like i said it's been a great collaborative conservation success story and in addition to the the buy-in from the Cayman Islands Department of Environment and the support that they've given us, being able to do outreach and education, like Chris was talking about it, you just, you know, and it, it's hard sometimes. And a couple of our collaborators, they've walked into, a, you know, a community meeting on Cayman Brack and he got punched in the face, you know, but you keep going and you win them over. And um, a, a big part of that is education and outreach. We have a, a strong um, education component that we do with the classroom throughout the Cayman Islands. Todd Bohannon, wave your, wave your hand, Todd. Todd. Todd Bohannon, he's been running that education program for the last 10 years, and it's been um, a really important part of that work. So if you're not familiar with it, that project of reefs, now you are. And um, now I'm going to switch gears and ask Andrea to come up. You're going to connect your computer, right? Okay. Um, I'm, it's my honor to invite Andrea up to the, the podium and, um, Andrea and I, similarly, I'm, I'm really lucky. I get to.